Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Thursday, June 15th, 2017. A reminder to self and other self-employed individuals. This is a deadline day to send a check to the feds and your state tax authorities. Your estimated taxes are due. And I hope that reminds me enough to actually put it in the mail today. So uh, Oliver Stone is a controversial filmmaker here in the United States, and he is currently fronting a three-part series on Showtime, a series of one-on-one interviews with Russia's leader Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. And it's fair to say that it is a friendly forum that Stone has created. Doesn't mean there aren't some tough questions. But he's been derided for conducting a fawning interview with a dictator. And I don't think it's fawning so much as it is listening to what Putin has to say. And I find Putin fascinating. He's extremely smart. He's not a grandstander or a showboat like Trump. He doesn't engage in bullshitting or name-calling or excessive posturing. He shows great self-confidence, being on the same footing as the United States. And he offered a number of interesting perspectives, the Russian view of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Well, he hastened to provide some context that the USSR sent nuclear-tipped missiles to Cuba in response to the U.S. deployment of missiles in Turkey that were aimed at the Soviet Union. And most American accounts never include that. It was just this courageous showdown by John F. Kennedy facing the brutal Russians. And as always, there is more to the story than the U.S. media and our self-serving history often depicts. And some of it was just the kind of uh, fluffy B-roll or scenes that you would see in a Barbara Walters profile. We see uh, Stone being driven around by Putin himself in a Mercedes. Of course, there are security cars before and behind him. But American presidents aren't allowed to drive. (laughs) And Putin uh, apparently is. He also takes uh, Stone and the film crew to one of his hockey games. Putin says he only took up hockey a few years ago when he turned 50 or 60, I don't recall. And that uh, he, he also had, I think, a fascinating explanation for the stage of democracy that Russia is in today. There was also uh, the early stages, uh, a setup in the episode I saw, for part three, where Putin goes into some detail about the U.S. involvement in the Ukrainian coup and the annexation of Crimea by Russia a few years back. Now, I don't believe that watching this, learning from it, understanding what Russia's viewpoint is, what Putin's thinking might be, is somehow dangerous or damaging. It doesn't change my view that Putin is a complex figure. He is a dictator. And while they have, you know, certain democratic mechanisms in Russia, it's fair to say that he is the strong-arm leader of that country. And it's important to note, as we will touch on in a moment, that many of Putin's enemies and adversaries have wound up dead. And I am not uh, oblivious to that or soft on that. And I guess right here is where I have to respond to that woman who attacked me on Facebook last weekend by intoning one of those who was red-baited in the 1950s, challenging Senator Joe McCarthy with, Have you no shame, Senator? Because Americans are so invested in hating Russia, in Russophobia today, that many people can't think clearly. They can't watch an interview with Putin without feeling like their nationalism is being challenged. 
And so Oliver Stone went on Stephen Colbert's show. Colbert has become the most reliable, hard-line critic comic of Trump. And a lot of what he does is very funny. In some ways, he has eclipsed the Daily Show from which he came in terms of uh, consistent, hard-hitting, daily topical humor. But when Oliver Stone told Stephen Colbert that Israel had far more involvement in the U.S. election than Russia, well, the Russia haters pounced. And I'm looking at uh, redstate.com, one of the alt-right websites, and it describes Stone's series of interviews with Putin as naked propaganda. There is no other way to describe what Stone is doing in this interview. And they even served up an attack that his comparison with Israel was flatly anti-Semitic. Now, I don't know how you get from here to there. And I'm not exactly sure what Stone meant about Israel had more involvement than Russia, because clearly Israel favored Trump over Hillary. Netanyahu was, you know, not really in the foreground, but the friends of Israel, I think, were divided because Hillary had been a staunch supporter, given a lot of lip, uh, lip service to AIPAC. But this is the kind of virulent pushback you get when you're Oliver Stone and you present a foreign leader and allow him to speak in his own words, his own terms. And you trust the intelligence of the viewer sufficiently that they're going to decide what's credible from Putin and what's not. So I'm pleased to see that my friend Bob Perry at ConsortiumNews.com awarded Oliver Stone the Gary Webb Freedom of the Press Award on June 3rd. And Perry singles out Oliver Stone's work on a range of documentaries, including South of the Border, the Snowden film, Ukraine on Fire, and now the Putin interviews. And Stone has also helped finance and produce documentaries hosted or uh, developed by other individuals. And Bob Perry took the opportunity to give his readers at ConsortiumNews.com some of the commentary that came from the Putin interviews. And in particular, I'm linking to his piece published uh, today, which uh, takes a look at, uh, I think, episode three, which I have not yet seen. And it replays the issues of the 2014 change of the guard in Ukraine, which uh, is not acknowledged as a U.S.-backed coup, but many of us, like Bob Perry and me, believe that that was the case. And what Perry does is give you the American narrative and then shows how Putin's version departs from that. For example, most people widely believe in the United States that Russia just stole Crimea. The history of Crimea is very much Russian. It's their only deep water port for their naval uh, vessels. And Putin's version, which is legitimate, but I still have questions, was, well, you know, there was a referendum there. We didn't just annex Crimea. The citizens voted, and then the parliament of Crimea uh, asked the Russian Federation if it could become a part of Russia. Now, this is one of those cases where Putin's version is not real satisfying to me, because if you remember that referendum, it was hustled up in a week or two. The question on the ballot was extremely vague. And yes, a, you know, a huge majority of people voted for it. And I do think it probably reflected their attitudes. But the process was uh, a rush job, <laughs> at, uh, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is the inconvenient trail of dead bodies, many of which lead back to Putin. And my friend Jason Leopold, who's now at BuzzFeed, has spent the last three months working with BuzzFeed's British team on an investigation that they published this week. 
And while I do have some questions about the basis for some assertions here, let me first share with you what they have reported. Alexander Parapolishny was uh, assassinated in Britain in 2012. That's what is asserted by BuzzFeed. And they're saying that Putin or people close to him gave direct orders for this financier who'd become a whistleblower to be, well, silenced. Now, what BuzzFeed has done is dug into the inquest into his death, and BuzzFeed is demanding that the British get access to American intelligence, which they say BuzzFeed does. Quote, BuzzFeed News revealed that a highly classified report on Russian state assassinations compiled for the U.S. Congress by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence last year asserts with high confidence that Parapolishny's uh, murder was sanctioned by Russian President Vladimir Putin, according to two U.S. intelligence officials. Well, the problem I have is we don't know the names of those intelligence officials. This is unsourced, anonymous leaking. And it is based on these assertions and assessments, which are tagged as high confidence. Well, I don't have high confidence in any assertion or assessment that comes from the CIA. I'm sorry, but uh, their track record is so sordid and sorry that I require evidence, proof. And we're not seeing that in this report. But I, I do take, uh, in general as true, the idea that a lot of people, journalists and others, former spies who have been critical of Putin, do wind up dead. A polonium cocktail here, in the case of uh, this financier, they think that some poisoned vegetation that may have been acquired from the beautiful Kew Gardens outside London, that's their big botanical garden, they believe that that may have been the cause of death. And they also bring in this incredibly beautiful Russian woman, uh, actually Ukrainian woman, who was 22 years old at the time that Para Polishny met her in Paris for apparently a secret tryst. And police never spoke to her. He died the day after their allegedly secret connection in Paris. So there does appear to be uninvestigated uh, material here. But I still am not comfortable relying on leaks and assessments and high confidence to say with any certainty that Putin was responsible. Meanwhile, the United States Senate voted 97 to 2 to impose new sanctions on Russia in reaction to the unproven allegations that Russia tried to manipulate the presidential election here in the U.S. last year. The only two senators who voted against it were Republicans Mike Lee of Utah and Rand Paul of Kentucky. And I find this distressing. Because, as I've mentioned, this package of sanctions is going to be attached to new sanctions against Iran which have a murky basis just like the Russian sanctions do. And there will be a showdown to see if Trump will sign the sanctions because he's gung-ho about taking on Iran, but this would attack his sacred cow called Russia. So now we get to the latest uh, reporting from the media, again based, unfortunately, on anonymous sources inside the government. And late yesterday, the Washington Post asserted that Bob Mueller, the special counsel, has expanded his investigation to include possible obstruction of justice by the president, presumably in the firing of Jim Comey. Now, I want to compare similar reports in the Washington Post and the New York Times so that you can get a flavor here. Because the Post just flatly asserts that the special counsel is interviewing senior intelligence officials as part of a widening probe that now includes an examination of whether President Trump attempted to obstruct justice, officials said. 
but we don't know the names of those officials. Next paragraph. Uh, let's see. The move by special counsel. Major turning point, the nearly year-old FBI investigation, which until recently focused on Russian meddling during the campaign and whether there was any coordination. Investigators have also been looking for any evidence of possible financial crimes among Trump associates. Officials said we're not allowed to know who they are. Five people briefed on the interview request, speaking on the condition of anonymity, said that Dan Coats, the current director of national intelligence, Mike Rogers, head of the NSA, and Rogers' recently departed deputy Richard Leggett have agreed to be interviewed by Mueller's investigators as early as this week. The investigation has been cloaked in secrecy, but it leaks just like everything else in Washington. And so I take this as true. Let me now read the language from the New York Times, which was much more circumspect. It opens, Mueller has requested interviews with three high-ranking current or former intelligence officials, the latest indication that he will investigate whether Trump obstructed justice. And later on, they say that the information suggests that Trump is being investigated. They use a lot of qualifiers, like the FBI's gathering information about the possibility of a crime. Doesn't necessarily mean prosecutors are building a case against the president. So there, there's a little bit of a gray area between the assertions of the Washington Post and the reporting of the New York Times. And one of the things that uh, we don't know yet is whether Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general who, because Sessions allegedly recused himself, is in charge of the special counsel, did Rosenstein know that Trump had interviewed Bob Mueller for the FBI job just the day before Rosenstein appointed him as special counsel? That's a weird <laughs> uh, coincidence, if that's all it is. But it has raised questions, and it's part of the talking points being used by Republicans who are out there peppering the media with pro-Trump statements. And so as we look at this, we have to weigh on exactly, you know, weigh what exactly could come out of this. Because if Mueller refers a criminal indictment against the president for obstruction of justice... Well, it can't be addressed until after Trump leaves the presidency. And if this is used as the basis for impeachment, we still have to get Republicans to decide that their butts are on the line for supporting Trump and that he is a greater liability to their futures than a benefit to their agenda of cutting taxes, eviscerating health care, expanding the perpetual wars, etc. So one writer at The Fix, which is a column at The Washington Post, wrote that uh, the tweet that came from Trump confirms the obstruction investigation. Just before 7 a.m. Washington time today, Trump tweeted, they made up a phony collusion with the Russian story, found zero proof, so now they go for obstruction of justice on the phony story. Nice, said Trump. He also tweeted that uh, the Russia investigation is a witch hunt. The people who are leading it are very bad. Can't you expand your vocabulary there, Donald? And uh, this kind of uh, insult to Bob Mueller is probably not going to help Trump in any way, shape, or form. But he's compulsive about this. And he keeps stepping on his own associates, his, uh, uh, you know, junkyard dog of a lawyer. And it just gets messier and messier all the time. So Jeff Sessions, when he was testifying before the Senate Intelligence Committee on Tuesday, reminded me a lot of George W. Bush's attorney general, Alberto Gonzalez. Do you remember this guy? 72 times in one session, he said... No, sir, I don't remember where that conversation...
took place. I don't, I don't recall either. Senator, I, I have no recollection of knowing okay. when that occurred. I don't recall the, uh, the specific mention of this conversation. I, I don't recall, Mr. Senator, I don't recall any dissent. I don't recall, and I don't, I, I don't recall whether it was Mr. Mercer who presented me the number. Seventy-two times he said he didn't recall. Well, Jeff Sessions didn't uh, mount that kind of account, but in one critical denial that he made to John McCain in the hearing on Tuesday, McCain asked him whether Sessions had ever had any contacts with any representative, including an American lobbyist or agent of any Russian company, during the 2016 campaign. And Sessions said, I don't believe so. Well, now, former ambassador to Germany during the Reagan administration, Richard Burt, not to be confused with Richard Burr, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, a Republican, but Richard Burt has represented Russian interests in Washington for many years, and it's widely known that that's the case. And he attended two events, dinners, hosted by Jeff Sessions. We don't know what conversations occurred, but this is a direct contradiction of Sessions' testimony under oath. And it will be very interesting to see how this folds into the Mueller investigation and whether the prediction that Comey made or the, the, the kind of offhand remark about uh, another matter that was problematic related to Sessions that would have required him to recuse himself, well, maybe this is part of that problematic behavior. Every day I like to pause for a second and thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. People like the folks at DGL, Tracy Williams, Paul Lacombe, just took out a new subscription, a monthly subscription. Thank you, Paul. And David Levine, who's been around for a while. I appreciate each and every one of you. I invite new subscribers to check in and uh, pony up. I could use your help. I don't get paid much money, uh, maybe a couple of bucks a day to host this podcast. And I'd love to make a living out of it. So if you can help out and support my work here, come on over to PeterBCollins.com. Click on the menu button on any device. Follow that to become a subscriber. That takes you to the sign-up page. And in just a couple of minutes, you can pick a level that is comfortable for you. If you take out a $50 annual subscription, give me a mailing address in the continental U.S., I've got a bonus book for you. Now, one other complication is that the allegation that James Comey made that Trump asked him to let go of the Flynn investigation. And what's swirling in Washington is information about whether Mike Rogers or Dan Coats was pressured in the same way. And media reports indicate that they were, but both of them stonewalled when they came before the Intelligence Committee last week. And I did a search for Mike Rogers, NSA, Trump collusion. And the only mainstream media outlet I could find with this story was the Daily Mail, dated May 27th of this year. And it reports that Mike Rogers had told a staff meeting that there's damning evidence that Trump and his team colluded with the Russian government. And more significantly, he said that uh, Trump, tried to get him to go public and deny that Trump was involved. And the individual, a former NSA staffer who leaked this information by giving his name, uh, his name is John uh, Schindler, he said Rogers anecdotally flatly denied Trump's request, which, if true, was inappropriate, unethical, and dubiously legal. So this is going to be critical. Will these individuals, these top officials, who may have been subject to efforts by Trump to persuade them to do unethical and illegal things, will they tell the truth? That could be at the core of the outcome of this whole sequence of events. The allegations that the U.S. is using white phosphorus as a weapon in Iraq and Syria has been given fresh information from Human Rights Watch. Now, the U.S. military says it only uses white phosphorus in a lawful way, but we have seen evidence of its deployment in Mosul and in the area near Raqqa in Syria. 
And this, of course, undermines the U.S. claims to purity about chemical weapons. One of the other contradictions that surfaced, you may recall, a week ago, Donald Trump was joining his good friends, the Saudi dictators, in denouncing Qatar and joining the Saudis and the UAE and Egypt in trying to isolate Qatar, trying to get them to shut down Al Jazeera, claiming that they are funding terrorism. At a high level, by the way, said Trump. And today it was announced that the U.S. has signed a $12 billion deal to sell fighter jets to Qatar. <laughs> oh, our foreign policy doesn't have to be consistent, does it? I mean, not from one week to the next, one tweet to the next. Come on. One of the claims Trump that made in his original travel ban, the decree back uh, at the end of January, was that he wanted to protect Christians who were being persecuted by Muslims in certain parts of the world. Well, over the weekend, in two cities, ICE rounded up almost 200 Iraqi nationals. In Detroit alone, the number is about uh, 114, I think. And in a community in, in Nashville, they rounded up Iraqis. And these are Chaldean Christians. And if you deport them to Iraq, many of them are people who've never actually been to Iraq, or at least not as adults, and they would be persecuted. Why is ICE rounding up these Iraqi Christians? Does one hand know what the other is doing? The father of the 22-year-old student from Cincinnati who was returned from North Korea yesterday said that his son was brutalized and terrorized during 18 months of captivity. He praised Trump because after he and his wife went on Fox and Friends, the Trump administration paid attention to this and did get the freedom of young Otto Warmbier. And he criticized the Obama administration. He said their officials advised the family to stay quiet in order not to antagonize the North Koreans. And the North Koreans said that the neurological damage done to young Otto was caused by botulism and a sleeping pill in combination. And the dad said, even if you believe their explanation of botulism and a sleeping pill causing the coma, and we don't, there's no excuse for any civilized nation to have kept his condition secret and denied him medical care for so long. Meanwhile, uh, the alt ambassador, Dennis Rodman, has been in Pyongyang for five days now and has yet to get a meeting with his buddy, Kim Jong-un. Now, Rodman, who knows Trump, he was uh, on one season of The Apprentice, as I am told, took a copy of Trump's bestseller, The Art of the Deal, and posed with it for a picture in North Korea, apparently in an effort to secure a meeting with uh, the trigger-happy Kim Jong-un. In a very small story in the San Francisco Chronicle today, it's reported that U.S. troops are on the ground in southern Philippines on the, uh, in the city of Marawi, where the Islamic State-linked militants have been battling the government of Rodrigo Duterte. Now, Duterte has been angry at the United States, has threatened to eject U.S. forces from his country. There is a, uh, a prohibition in the Philippine Constitution on the presence of foreign combat troops. I'm not sure why they're there or if they'll get booted. Good news for the Standing Rock water protectors. A judge has ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to review the way it fast-tracked approval of the permit for the Dakota Access Pipeline. On Wednesday, a 91-page opinion issued by U.S. District Judge James Boasberg said that the Army Corps of Engineers substantially complied with the National Environmental Policy Act, but it failed to fully weigh how an oil spill could affect the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. He didn't order suspension of the pipeline, which went into service on June 1st, but there is a hearing on June 21st to discuss that. In Mexico, another journalist was brutally murdered in broad daylight. His name is uh, Javier Valdez, the sixth journalist to be assassinated in Mexico this year. And he was killed because he had been documenting political corruption and state links to drug trafficking. 
And the problems in Mexico are a corrupt government and violent cartels. And they wouldn't be there if it weren't for prohibition in the United States. That's what drives the drug economy in Mexico. And this Sunday, the History Channel is going to start a three-part series called America's War on Drugs, 9 p.m. Eastern, on the History Channel on Father's Day, Sunday night. And one of the executive producers is a journalist I have great respect for, Anthony LaPay. I've uh, contacted Anthony to see if I can get an interview and get more details on this series. And there's another three-part series I want to alert you to because it is alleged to be a propaganda series. And it's on PBS. A respected New York University professor of education, Diane Ravitch, wrote a piece at the Huffington Post today. I'll link to it in the show file for this podcast. And they described this three-hour series as to, uh, just a, a biased glorification of the privatization of America's public education system. And that, of course, is the agenda of Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, who bought her position in the cabinet with millions of dollars in donations to the Republicans over the years. And Professor Ravitch says that uh, this is very biased. You're going to see one-sided reporting, for example, about uh, privatized schools in Chile, but you won't learn that uh, the, the downside of what's going on there. Anyway, uh, I have not viewed this myself, but the professor investigated the funding for the program, and it is coming from uh, the Prometheus Foundation and also the Anderson Foundation. These are right-wing groups, and some of them are aligned with the Koch brothers. And it is shameful that PBS is essentially selling infomercial time on the nation's only independent and allegedly public television network. Thanks for joining me for my news and comment podcast. It's available free every day on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.